Hello. Ms. Soto, can you hear me? Hello. We there's no uh, have you started already? Hello, can you hear me? Who is uh, this is Babak Nair with ADHS. Who is this? Hi, this is Cher with Coconino County. Um I, for some I, reason I, I don't hear anything. <laughs> I don't either. I just hear you. <laughs> Hi, Quebec. Yeah, and everyone, can you hear me now? It's Yanitza. Yeah. Yes. No, I can we, yes, I can Okay. Hear you. <laughs> Sorry, we had some technical difficulties, but sounds like we are on now. I was going to ask Sharon to give the presentation. I would just be the audience. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. Thank you. So we'll go ahead okay, and get I'm started on. one more time. Let's start from the top. So welcome everyone to our evidence-based public health workshop on number three, evaluating the program or policy. Uh, my name is Yanitza Soto. Welcome to anyone who, if this is your first time participating with us in our workshop series and welcome back to everyone who has been with us throughout the last three weeks. Our outline today includes recapping the timeline of evidence-based public health training in Arizona. We'll share the modules uh, that are included in, within evidence-based public health training. We'll quickly review our group rules, the evidence-based public health framework, and then finally get into evaluating the program or policy outline. So this outline here demonstrates really the history of our evidence-based public health and um, educational series and where it started, where the idea started, and how we are, where we are here today. Um, back in March 2018, uh, ADHS staff was invited to attend an evidence-based public health training at the Prevention Research Center in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we attended on behalf of the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors and Prevention Research Center. Um, flash forward then to October 2018 at our HPHC IGA Fall Summit. Um, county health departments provided input on the idea of an upcoming webinar series, and they were also surveyed on the topics and categories of highest interest, and those topics have been the three that we selected then to provide this webinar series on. Um, now, July 2019, we've provided the webinar series um, for both state and county health department employees. Um, again, we selected the top three choices, and we are now at our workshop number three today. And finally, we hope that this webinar series will contribute to your planning for year five implementation, help you think a little bit differently about the goals and activities you've selected, and also how you will integrate anything you've learned about evidence-based public health into your practices within your IGA work. This outline here includes the modules for the evidence-based public health curriculum. You'll, you'll notice there, number one, conducting the community assessments, what we reviewed, um, the first week, developing an action plan we reviewed last week, and today we are evaluating the program or policy. Just a quick summary of our time together. So we are on evaluating program or policy today. Our group rules, please remember to place your speakers and phones on mute. We still hear a little bit of feedback. Um, please just double check that your phones and speakers are on mute. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat box uh, to share your question or any relevant experience you'd like to share with the group. And thank you for participating in the entire webinar series, or thank you for joining us today if this is your first one. So this equation here really answers the question of what is public health? What is evidence-based public health? So I hope that in the future when um, someone may ask you that question, you might read about evidence-based public health or a program manager from ADHS might ask you if your program is evidence-based, this equation should come to mind. Um, we've learned throughout the last three weeks that this is a process of integrating science-based interventions with community preferences in order to improve the health of populations. So you see there the equation, we have our science-based intervention that has been proven to work effectively and to create change then we know our community preferences within the community that we're working and representing. And in the end, we hope to bring those two together um, to reach population health improvement overall. One other item I hope that you dream about after today is this evidence-based public health framework. Um, so this, again, includes 
all of the evidence-based modules in the curriculum in, in every color. Um, and today we are on the left-hand side, the dark blue, evaluating the program or policy, and this really demonstrates how everything fits together um, to really then be in total what evidence-based public health is. So evidence-based public health and accreditation, we reviewed this last week, and this is definitely important to keep in as a reminder that voluntary public health accreditation also supports evidence-based public health practices in a complementary relationship. As part of the accreditation requirements, health departments must demonstrate they are implementing evidence-based programs and interventions, as well as staying up to date with relevant research. <clears throat> So what is evidence-based decision-making? Um, first, we ask a question. Second, we find information and evidence that could support our question, or even that finding information and evidence to first answer the question we have, or to even learn if that question has been asked already in the past. Third, we crit critically appraise information and evidence. Fourth, we integrate appraised evidence for preferences, and finally, then we evaluate. So defining evidence, um, we see then at the lower, the lower end of the blue arrow, we have our subjective evidence, which is really based on personal experience. If you've joined us over the last three weeks, you'll remember my green sweater example, which I won't um, share again today, but that was much more based off of personal experience where that was my opinion and my experience and that was not shared or really tested objectively. Then as we move higher up the blue arrow, you'll notice that at the highest level with objective evidence that has been scientific, that has scientific literature with systematic reviews that really has been proven and vetted to, to be effective. And that's the area um, within the middle of the arrow and the higher up we get, that's really the area that we would like you to focus on the programs that you're implementing. The domains of influence for evidence-based decision-making is really where we should begin before we get into evidence-based public health. It really all starts with decision-making. Um, at the top, we see that before, in order to make an informed decision, we should refer to the best available research evidence. Down to the right-hand side, we refer to resources, including any practitioner expertise, and that practitioner could include you as program managers and as county experts within your area. And then down to the left, we see that it includes population characteristics, needs, values, and preferences. And we definitely know that our counties across the state, that category most likely looks very different for any area that you're in. So that should be definitely considered a high priority for decision making in the programs that you select. So did you know today, if you participated in our last three weeks, you'll notice we have a did you know slide that will sporadically pop up during the presentation. Today we'll talk about guinea pigs. So in Switzerland, it is illegal to own just one guinea pig since they are considered social animals and they, are, they would be considered victims of abuse if they are left alone. So if you live in Switzerland, make sure you have two guinea pigs. And even if you live in Arizona, maybe you should have two guinea pigs. <laughs> Okay, on a more serious note, now we'll be getting into evaluating a program or policy. Our learning objectives include understand the basic components of program evaluation, understand the various types of evaluation designs useful in program evaluation, and understanding qualitative and quantitative methods. An activity uh, to begin with is for everyone to please think of a program you currently oversee or are implementing. Think about what types of evaluation methods you are currently using. And also think of a program you'd like to strengthen the evalu evaluation methods for. It could be the same program you thought of with the first question or perhaps a different program. So we'll think about that briefly. And as you think about this activity, um, Make sure you have that maybe jot it down, write it down, so that you can be referring back to what came to mind for you throughout the presentation. Here we also have the decision-making domains, and it looks a little bit different. The difference here is that we have the big blue bubble around, which includes the environmental and organizational context. 
So this refers to the domains of influence for decision making on selecting the type of program that we wish to implement. But it also includes the type of, we should also consider then the type of evaluation methods that would also best suit the needs of your program. So this decision making, um, these decision making domains, I'm sorry, could be used for either, for both, the decision making on which program you would like to select to implement, but also the evaluation method that you would like to select. So answering the question, what is program evaluation? Program evaluation is a process that attempts to determine as systematically and objectively, if we remember now the blue arrow that we saw earlier, as possible the relevance, effectiveness, and impact of activities in light of their objectives. So the best evaluations often triangulate. So triangulate refers to using different methods. This is a process that can be combined with both quantitative and qualitative methods, and an example includes looking in a room from two different windows. This is helpful to include different perspectives in order to see things from different angles. And in this way, processes can also be explained in different ways if needed. So if we picture when a room with two windows, if you look into one room, you'll see completely different angles and details versus looking into um, another window, um, you'll see different angles and details. So evaluation really helps then to triangulate and bring all of those details and perspectives together. Program evaluation is intended to answer in one long, very um, run-on sentence. It is intended to answer which program or policy components are most effective for producing outcomes for populations when implemented under certain conditions, measuring how many resources, and stating how and why these results come about. So those points are highlighted such as components, outcomes, populations, conditions, resources, and answering how and why, since those are really um, the main points that we tend to focus on and consider when selecting programs and then selecting evaluation methods for those programs. So asking the question, why should we evaluate? It would be really simple not to evaluate, and that would remove a really big, um, really big amount of time and focus and energy that we, that we place on evaluation, but still answering why do we evaluate? This improves existing programs and measures the effectiveness, demonstrates accountability for the program implementation, it helps to share effective strategies and lessons learned, and it ensures funding and sustainability. We can also think of evaluation as a tool that can both measure and contribute to the success of your program. <clears throat> this program sustainability framework is a resource I'd like to share with everyone today. Um, this is in regards to ensuring that funding and sustainability uh, really becomes the main focus of your programming. This online tool is called Program Sustainability Assessment Tool. If you'd like to visit sustaintool.org, it's showing on the screen now, to learn more about it. Um, this tool is a 40-question self-assessment. Both your program staff and stakeholders can take the assessment to evaluate the sustainability and capacity of your program. When you take the assessment online, you will receive a summary report of your overall sustainability. And you can use this, these results to help with sustainability planning. The assessment is made up, again, of 40 multiple choice questions, and it shouldn't take longer than 10 to 15 minutes. The assessment can be used by programs at the community, state, and national levels. The assessment can also be taken at, as an individual or a group. It is also used by various programs throughout public health, social services, clinical care, and educational programs and have all found the assessment to be very relevant to their work. So we hope that this uh, resource can help you identify um, your current sustainability with any programs and also help identify how effective your program might be across the eight sustainability domains that we see here on the screen. So questions to continue asking for evaluation. And please continue to ask yourself these questions and write down these, these thoughts that come to mind. Do we currently have a research or evaluation person on staff that this is their main um, priority to focus on? Is there time or other resources that we can allocate to focus on evaluation? 
Do we have the necessary skills and knowledge for the evaluation? And do we have a realistic evaluation plan for our program? Another activity here, please consider the question, in program planning, when should you begin the planning, when should you begin planning an evaluation? You can use a chat box or unmute your phone if you'd like to answer. Would anyone like to share in program planning, when should you begin the evaluation planning? <clears throat> well, the answer is in the beginning. In the beginning is, is when uh, evaluation should be integrated with program planning. So including this process at the beginning can help contribute to program planning effectiveness. Thank you, Terry. I see your uh, comment now. So another did you know fact, an apple, a potato, and an onion all taste the same if you eat them with your nose plug. Our sense of taste is 80% made up of our sense of smell. If you were blindfolded and plug your nose, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the three foods. Mm. <laughs> Moving along with our next learning objective, understanding the various types of evaluation designs useful in program evaluation. The first type is formative evaluation, which includes an, an element of a program or policy, such as materials or messages, feasible, appropriate, and meaningful for your target population, often in the planning stages of a, ver of a new program, and often examining contextual factors. Considerations that we should keep in mind for formative evaluation include sources of data that we have access to, any limitations of data, such as the completeness of the data that we have access to, the time frame, whether or not it falls within the period of our program, and availability and cost. Examples of formative evaluation include attitudes among school officials toward a proposed healthy eating program, that's what we would be measuring, as well as measuring barriers and policies toward healthy eating. The next type of evaluation includes process evaluation, so shorter term feedback on program implementation, content, methods, participant response and practitioner response. So practitioner response would be an opportunity where quality improvement processes would be an opportunity um, for your public health department to really then increase the processes and how things are done more effectively and efficiently uh, within your program. And it also highlights what is working and what is not working. Process evaluation is also a direct extension of action planning in, that we referred to in our previous module. It uses quantitative and qualitative data, which we'll learn about in a couple more slides. And data usually involves counts, not rates or ratios. The next type of evaluation is, I'm sorry. So we're still on process evaluation. So considerations for process evaluation include, again, our sources of data, any limitations, again, completeness, the time frame we have and availability and cost. And examples of a process evaluation would be measuring the satisfaction with a diabetes prevention program training and how resources are being allocated. And again, these are simply examples to learn the concepts. We understand that uh, areas and categories such as diabetes may not be included within the IGA, um, but it is certainly just to share the example of how to measure using a process evaluation. The next type of evaluation is impact evaluation. We know here with impact, it is long-term long or short-term feedback on knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. This uses quantitative and or qualitative data. It, it is also called um, summative evaluation. And it's probably more realistic, um, a realistic endpoint for most public health programs or policies. 
Considerations for impact evaluation include our sources of data, so any surveillance or program data that we might have access to. The limitations here of the data would be validity and reliability, which we'll also refer um, more to later on in the presentation, our time frame and our availability and cost. And examples of impact evaluation would be measuring the number of cigarette packs sold per year in Arizona and also measuring smoking rates and tobacco control funding in Arizona. Next, we have outcome evaluation, <clears throat> which includes long-term feedback on health status, morbidity, which refers to the rate of disease in a population, mortality, which is referring to the rate of death in a population, and quality of health. This also uses quantitative data. Quantitative data expresses a certain quantity, amount, or range. It is also called summative evaluation, and it's often used in strategic plans. A special note for outcome evaluation is that this is the type of evaluation that takes the longest to change over time. So it most likely wouldn't be recommended for a program that would be implemented within a year. Outcome evaluation um, takes much longer to change, so perhaps maybe three to five years. Considerations for outcome evaluation include sources of data. So that is routine surveillance data that we are um, collecting on an ongoing basis. Limitations of the data are also validity and reliability. The time frame that we have to measure this evaluation and the availability and cost, which often is the least expensive to find. And examples of outcome evaluation include measuring or demonstrating the geographic distribution of heart disease, as well as measuring the trends in heart disease mortality over time. So the image here says, at the beginning of every evaluation, there might be someone that says, I know our project works. Well, we have someone else, most likely the evaluator saying, no, you don't. Um, so I think this is kind of funny because we all would like to believe that our project and program will work when we select it, and we all would like to believe that we know positively um, that it is just working because we believe it does. Um, but in the end, we, we actually don't know it does unless we have the proper evaluation methods in place that could really tell the story of how and why successful, and how successful our project was and why it was. Uh, but not, evaluation shouldn't only focus on successes, it should also include um, any challenges and barriers also. Um, so evaluation could highlight the very positives of, of why a project works, but it should also demonstrate and include um, those challenges and barriers so that then the next project and future projects um, perhaps can learn from that experience. So learning more now of concepts of validity and reliability and their importance and how they could also be evaluation threats. So these help to answer, did the intervention really work or was it something else? So validity is the instrument or design measuring exactly what, is, what was intended. I'll read that one more time. Validity is the instrument or design measuring exactly what was intended. So a valid evaluation instrument is one that will measure what you are intending to measure. So validity is also the extent to which a measure can accurately capture what is intended to capture. Whereas reliability answers the question, is the measurement being conducted consistently? In other words, reliability is the likelihood that the instrument will get the same result time after time. And when we refer to instrument, instrument we're most likely referring to the project that we are working on or the evaluation tool that we've selected. So measurement issues may include, um, again, those evaluation instruments that often need community contouring. So uh, community contouring referring more to making it more uh, adaptable to the communities that you are representing. And that also includes participatory methods that may prevent the use of existing instruments or questions. So for example, if we have selected an, an evaluation instrument and it includes some questions to ask our participants in our project, if we review those questions, they might not be appropriate or the best fit for our community. So that's when then this becomes um, 
a method that might bring up some issues, but that doesn't mean that we wouldn't have the opportunity to adapt that to our communities. So the next did you know fact is that movie trailers were originally shown after the movie, which is why they are called trailers. The problem though with the trailer showing after the film is that audiences wouldn't sit around to watch the film or to watch the trailer. So now they're not shown after, now they're shown on commercials. So you can <laughs> decide for yourself if you wanna watch the movie or not. So finally, our last learning objective is understanding qualitative and quantitative methods. So qualitative methods, qualitative data, and it occurs in natural settings. It is grounded in participant perspective. It describes the complexity, breadth, and range of occurrences. And it helps to generate hypothesis or those educated guesses that we believe may occur within our project or program. And is often paired with the, our counter um, method of data is quantitative. So we can refer to qualitative data and methods as non-numeric. Um, it is commonly used in public health, and this includes observational approaches, such as walkability assessments, any windshield tours, like if you leave um, like a, a flyer on a windshield, inviting anyone to participate, for example, in a focus group or an interview, any digital approaches like photos, photos and videos to demonstrate the project in action. And it really answers the what, not the how of the project. For qualitative and non-numeric methods, interviews and listening approaches are also commonly used, and this can be completed in an individual or group setting. Another example of qualitative uh, data could be individual interviews. So you may have experience with this if you interview your program participants, for example, on a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, most of the time, these could be really informal conversations so long as you're documenting the interaction. Um, there also could be a general interview guide that you're referring to, and questions could be standardized and open-ended. Um, the interviewer should be knowledgeable of the project or program or questions that you're asking, and also skilled in interpretation, which means it could mean either um, interpreting from one language to the other, that becomes very important to ensure nothing is sort of lost in translation, so to speak. <clears throat> Another method is focus groups we may be familiar with. Um, these are commonly semi-structured group data collection methods. It's an efficient way to get a range of responses from a larger um, pool of individuals. It is often moderated by a trained leader. The number of groups and participants can vary, so it can be a very small group, maybe two or three people, or it can be a, a bit larger. And the group dynamic needs should be considered. So that might be um, if it's youth being interviewed, if it's older adults being interviewed, maybe the time of day that would be most appropriate for the participants to attend, um, stuff like that. So when are qualitative methods helpful? So they're helpful to gain a comprehensive understanding of the program, to recognize unique, unique aspects of different settings, to gain insight into causal and contributing factors, to understand a program or policy and or people's experience with the program, and to gain an understanding of a program or policy's implementation process, and perhaps maybe where that process can, um, can be enhanced or changed. So principles include using open-ended questions and avoiding questions that can be answered in yes or no. Typically, it's no more than 10 to 12 questions. Um, they may flow from general questions to very specific questions. It's important to consider the appropriate probing questions that could elicit more information from your participants if you are participating in, in qualitative um, interviews or focus groups, and avoid using why questions and instead use what or how. So we can consider ways to engage participants, such as, are there other ways of looking at this? Who, who else has an idea? Let me see if I'm understanding you. Am I getting this right? So if we use think back questions, uh, these usually take people back to an experience and they don't necessarily ask about future information. And that's where we wanna focus on um, 
thinking back, having the participants think back to their experience, for example, in a project or program to really then gain that, that feedback for the data. So then capturing data, um, we can take notes during and after sessions. So capturing the key points, any notable quotes from participants really can help contribute to any success stories um, that you'd like to highlight for your program and any observations that you have uh, noted. And it's important also to debrief after, both with your focus groups, your interviewee, going over the key points to ensure that you capture that accurately. Um, observations might include any kind of silent agreements or body language or the environment that you might be uh, hosting the focus group or interview in, for example. Um, and data for analysis could include transcription of the notes that could be included in your evaluation, the interview or focus group, and also um, nonverbal communication could be uh, documented as well. <clears throat> so challenges of incorporating qualitative methods could include the time, so it requires some time allocation, some resources and expertise with this type of method, any sampling issues, the potential for conflicting results, and potential threat to confidentiality if your project or program um, has any really type of identifying information for participants that is more confidential. So it requires time, both yours um, and the participants, so that would require some scheduling as well. And some sampling issues could include maybe who to interview and making sure that it's a pretty diverse group um, from within the participants that you may be working with. So quantitative data, on the other hand, uh, is used um, as surveys or questionnaires, any surveillance data and other records. It also includes primary data. So if we remember from our first uh, presentation, primary data is any new data that is designed for the purpose of the evaluation at hand. And then also secondary data, which is any existing data that we can collect for the purpose other than the evaluation at hand but it's still capable of answering the current evaluation questions that we have for our current project to some extent, and that really becomes more supportive. Revisiting again the idea of why evaluating, we've um, gone over this before, but we'll go over it one more time to share its importance. So we evaluate to improve existing programs, to measure effectiveness, to demonstrate accountability, to share effective strategies and lessons learned, and to ensure funding and sustainability. So if we remember that evaluation is a tool that can both measure and contribute to the success of our program. So we can also remember that um, what a quote unquote good evaluation include, and we can definitely aim, continue to aim for that. So this is that type of evaluation would include pre and post data to really help to compare where we were in the beginning and where we are now. Um, it would include comparison groups if, if that's feasible for our project. Um, we would refer to then reliable and valid measures that we learned about. And it would potentially include both or if not one or the other qualitative and quantitative measures. And it would also address any resistance. So answering the question like, how can I do evaluation when there's so much real work to do is it, really a common thought that we might feel. And it's really to help determine if an independent or outside evaluator might be helpful. Um, and in that case, then you can um, look into those resources. And if we do determine that, for example, an independent or outside evaluating resource might be more helpful, these are some tips for working with evaluation consultants. So ensuring that you involve them early in the planning of the program, you articulate the program theory or framework that you are aiming for and working with, being specific about how you will use the results of the evaluation, making your expectations clear of the relationship of the evaluating consultant and the program, um, the program managers as well. And developing a good advisory committee then for evaluation that is commonly revisiting how the evaluation process and method is, is going throughout the program period. Budgeting enough money and time if this is a resource that you have allocated, as well as develop a standard for communication so that there is constant uh, and fluid communication between the evaluation team and the program team. 
It's also important to involve any stakeholders within the development of the program objectives and evaluation questions. Um, so if we are creating these programs for our communities, but yet our community's voice isn't included in the planning process, um, we will most likely then be um, kind of delayed and taking a couple steps back when maybe this type of project that we had selected wasn't a good fit for the community. It helps to measure program processes like impacts and outcomes using measures appropriate for the questions asked. And it presents the data that is captured in an objective and useful light. So a summary overall to also consider is that evaluation is a critical step in an evidence-based process of encouraging and creating health-promoting changes among individuals and within Arizona communities. So most of the time when we are referring to maybe perhaps selecting an evidence-based program or we may question is this program evidence-based or not, it's not only as, it's not because it's a judgmental question or we want to make sure that a certain box is checked, but it really is because it's the foundation for creating really the best type of um, environment then for individuals and communities in Arizona to thrive. So finally, acknowledgements would be thanking our ADHS HPHC team, so Desiree Green, Geraldine Haskin, and Holly Pointer, Thank you for your support and to Ross Bronson and the team at the St. Louis Prevention Research Center that helped to train um, myself and other state, state um, public health department employees on what is evidence-based public health and those, the module and curriculum that we referred to at the very beginning. And thank you to all of you for participating. Again, if this was your third uh, webinar joining us or your first, Thank you for taking the time out to learn more about how to strengthen um, your programs within your, your health department. Thank you. And we are recording this presentation. We'll, we're gonna record the other two as well and we'll most likely share them on the HPHC website if you need to refer to them um, for any resource in the future. Thank you, everyone.